I like this chapter in Hebrews, and the one we affectionately refer to as the Hall of Faith at times, and uh, a historical book in many ways in the sense of reflecting upon the stories of faith. And I like each of these individual stories, and uh, as we've delved into them, kind of glean something from it. As we do, we've understand, uh, kind of oversee the entirety of the chapters, a couple questions being asked. Why make such a big deal about faith? What exactly is faith? And so he began verse first couple verses to explain what's the big deal about faith? Why is faith so vital to the Christian life? And then really the remainder of the chapter is very much answered uh, or an answer to the question, what exactly is faith? And so we see it in, in work, uh, in action, I should say. We see it uh, worked out in people's lives. And uh, that's really what we saw even last week. We looked at verse number four. Can we look there again and just kind of re reflect and remind ourselves what we saw? By faith, Abel, he offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. And uh, we came to understand, uh, number one, these three that are found in Genesis 4, 5, and 6. Number one, a Abel displayed a worshiping faith. Faith in action and worship. And so Abel gives us a great example of that. From Genesis chapter 4, we read Cain and Abel, Adam and Eve's sons, and Cain having killed Abel, and so forth. And we derive four truths from both Genesis chapter 4 and also here the verse in Hebrews. The first one being this, Adam and Eve taught them to worship God. One of the avenues to do that was through the offerings or the sacrifices given unto God. And we saw that that statement is very much um, a, a continual truth found throughout scriptures. Uh, that even in the Revelation we see sacrifices and offerings made here in the New Testament. And we see it in our modern era. God has called us to present our bodies a living sacrifice. And so the, it's a continual thought throughout all of God's interactions with mankind. This offering of the sacrifice of praise and so forth. The, the offerings, worshiping him through offerings. Tonight we, we worship him. I hope you sang unto the Lord tonight. I, I hope you've given uh, in the offering unto the Lord. I, I hope that we worship the Lord by offering something. And that's what certainly they were taught and learned here. Secondly, you see Adam and Eve seemingly taught them the one and only right, um, let's get to it, the one right uh, way to approach God in worship. Okay, and uh, this derived from their time in the Garden of Eden, and uh, we said, what did, how, how did God deal with their sin? What happened afterwards? Well, uh, we saw that God had to shed blood, right? The animals, he had to kill them to provide clothing for them, and uh, in order that they, uh, in their realization of their nakedness, would, could fellowship with him and approach him. And so, we obviously see there's a great picture there, right? Uh, a, a great preview of Calvary. And we talked about what happened on Calvary was simply this, that you and I need to be clothed through faith in the robe of righteousness of Jesus Christ in order to come into his presence. And so you and I, in much the same way through the shedding of blood, can now be clothed with Christ's robe of righteousness so that we can approach Christ. And great truth pictured even there in the Garden of Eden. Then we said simply the third um, truth, uh, the thing that we could derive from it, deduce, would be this. Abel approached God in God's way, while Cain approached God in his own way. And we looked at those offerings and Cain giving the fruit of the ground as a farmer, Abel giving of the firstlings of his flock as a shepherd, and so forth. And uh, uh, we said that it's been said about Cain that he was the founder of man's first false religion. And the heart of that is found, or that thought is found in, at the heart of every false religion since the mankind has ever embraced. Why is that? Well, you boil it down and you see that at the heart of it um, is good works. It's human merit. It's you and I earning something, gaining something through our own effort. And so that's what, what Cain, in his mind, uh, could gain the presence of God through something that he did. And so we said this, and I think Hebrews chapter 11, verse 4 bears this out. Cain was religious, but he wasn't righteous. He had not claimed through faith the righteousness that was necessary. And many people today, they are going about getting their own righteousness as the New Testament was right. And they are not availing themselves of the righteousness of Jesus Christ through faith in him. And so um, we see that consistent with today, the false um, things. And, and we made this statement. I think this is crucial. Verse number 7 there in the passage in Genesis chapter 4. God makes it clear this is not an issue of sincerity. It's an issue of sin. Is not an issue of sincerity, an issue of sin. The reality is this. 
someone can be sincere in their good works and they can have zeal like Saul did when he was persecuting Christ and the Christians. They can be sincere as they want to do, but sincerity will not get you anything but lost. You have to deal with your sin, and the only way you can deal with your sin is through the righteousness of Jesus Christ being applied to your account. That's crucial. And so that is born out of that. I think Cain was as sincere as you could find, and yet he was sincerely wrong in coming to God in his own way. We saw the antithesis of that would be Abel. Abel approached God on God's terms, approached God in God's way, and offering the, the firstling of his flock, a lamb, shed its blood, and we made this statement that his offering was in keeping with the substitute needed, that picture, the sinner approaching a holy God on the merit of another. And the only way that you and I can have any kind of relationship with God in heaven is on the merit of Jesus Christ. What he did on the cross with Calvary. And so that's a beautiful picture there. Then we said, because of that, it necessitates the right gift, right? Uh, the right sacrifice. And so we made this observation from here in verse number 4 in Hebrews 11. If the right gift is offered, righteousness is received. And so as we look at verse number 4, it says, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous. And then it goes on to say, I told you I love the wording of this verse. God testifying of his gifts. His sacrifice was, uh, was uh, honored. It was received. And we made the statement that the Bible's not saying that Abel is righteous simply because he has faith, but because his faith is in the right and correct gift or sacrifice offered. That's why the Bible tells us that Christ or God testified of his gifts, that they were acceptable for approaching God. Many people today have faith. They'll tell you, oh yeah, I believe, in, I believe in a God, I believe there's a God, and they, they will uh, concur with you that, oh yeah, I believe there's some deity, some, someone out there, some cosmic force, I believe that's the case, yet the reality is, until their faith and trust is in Jesus Christ alone as payment for their sin, their gift and sacrifice, his sacrifice, excuse me, offered freely for them, there is no value to their faith. There's no value to their faith. And so that is at the crux of Hebrews chapter 11. As we said at the beginning, uh, your faith is only as strong as the object of your faith, okay, that you put it in. And so that is certainly true here. And then we made that last statement. I love the end of verse number, verse number four. You say, well, what good did Abel's death do? Boy, he offered a sacrifice, and, and uh, Cain got angry, mad, wroth. He killed him. So what, what good did it do for Abel? I like the rest of the verse, right? And by it, he being dead, yet speaketh. You know, there'll be a lot of people who said, you know, it's funny to me because there'll be a lot of people saying, well, so-and-so speaks from the grave. Well, the Bible's literally saying that here about Abel. He speaks from the grave. And literally, what is he doing? He's preaching. He's preaching uh, that approaching God by faith in the way which God alone has prescribed. If you're going to come to God, you have to do it on his own terms. You have to do it according to what he lays out in Scripture, and that's, that's crucial. In uh, God's way alone, in Christ alone, we could say. And so now, verse number five. We come to the next statement here. We, we get probably introduced to one of the most interesting people in all the Scriptures. We often read of somebody in the Scriptures, and you mean, I wish there was a whole other chapter about this guy. I, I wish there was a little bit more information, a little more historical aspect about it, and, and so forth. And we read that, and Enoch, uh, Enoch is one of these guys, right? Uh, he's found in chapter, Genesis chapter 5. You know what Genesis chapter 5 is? I call it the cemetery chapter. You know why? Because all the people there are listening. He lived so many years, maybe had a child or two, and he died, and he died, and he died. That's all it says, verse after verse after verse, and he died, and he died, and he died, and he died, okay? And, and yet, in the middle of the chapter, what do we find? Enoch didn't die. He didn't die. He, he, here in the middle, he's a bright spot in what I, again, would call the cemetery chapter. He's a bright spot. It was not so with him. Look at verse 5 here in Hebrews chapter 11, if you will. Time to wake up. If you're not awake, that's your alarm. Wake up. He, okay, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. Look at the first part with me, if you will. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 5. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death. Okay, now that's a great statement. Enoch in this chapter kind of stands halfway between the fall of man and the flood. I like to think of it this way. He stands between the commission of sin and the destruction brought by sin uh, in chapter number 5. And as he's kind of there in the middle way, we read these words about him that he is translated. Okay, He really enjoyed a unique fruit of his faith. Why did we find him in Hebrews chapter 11? Because God did something special with him. 
God did something unique. We hadn't experienced that before, really, and we haven't seen it in the Scriptures. In fact, Enoch is the first man that cheats death. He's the first man that we read of in the scriptures that he did not experience. He did not face death. I like the terminology there. Didn't face death. He, he didn't come face to face with it uh, as reality is for mankind is unless God intervenes. So as we read in this statement, it says something else. It says that he was um, translated. Translated. It's an interesting word, isn't it? And uh, um, we know maybe what the term translated means. It also gives this sense of and, uh, these correlating words, transferred or transposed. Transferred or transposed, okay? Um, we have many a missionary come here and speak about translations. Brother Steinbart was just here speaking about it, quite interesting, talking to him about his translation process and some of the struggles within it and uh, so forth. Need to find out about as they're translating into Swahili, um, uh, the, um, the Bible and so forth, and progressing with that. What do you do in a translation? Well, you take something, and whether that be a Bible or a book, you take it from one language and change it into another, right? You, you, you translate it. Well, the term transfer, we're certainly familiar with that. Many of you worked in a job, a situation, maybe a factory, and, and you know the idea of being transferred from one factory to another, from one position to another. You're, you're moved from that position to this position. You're transferred. I like the term transpose because if you're a musician here tonight, you, you know what that terminology means and transposing of music has to take place often. When you transpose a piece of music, you're taking it from one key to another key. For our Christmas cantata this year, we uh, had to transpose some, some music. I believe Erica and uh, Erica Stevens, some others got together and they transposed some of the music. Okay, Carter plays the viola. The viola is in a different key, if I remember correctly, than the, the violin. And so often we have to transpose music. So you change it, you take it from one key and put it into another key so that someone can play it. Or in, in my case, if you don't like singing soprano, you can transpose into a bass part, right? And a different key and sometimes. But anyway, you can transpose music, right? You can take it and change it into it. That's exactly what happened to Enoch. That's the picture here of what transpired and what, what took place as God describes. He was transposed. He was translated. He was transferred from one realm of life to the other. Uh, he was carried away. And I, Genesis chapter 5 probably puts it the most descriptive in a sense. And I, I like this. He says that this, God simply took him. For God took him. God took him. This is why as we study this um, passage, okay, uh, the best part of it is what? Well, what we read in Hebrews 11.5. God took him and he did not see death. He didn't have to face it. He didn't have to come to, to terms with the, the decay of the body and so forth and, and such. And uh, we were talking the other day about uh, with a fellow believer and the reality of not fearing death. You just find a kind of fear the process, amen? <laughs> we fear the process. And, or don't look forward to the process as maybe a better description. Enoch didn't have to face that. He didn't have to go through that. You and I, many of us, have had to bury loved ones. We didn't have to bury family members and friends and so forth. And that's not pleasurable. That's not an enjoyable situation at all. Certainly God gives grace, but none of us uh, desire to go through that. So Enoch didn't have to face that. He was translated. And, and furthermore, the statement in, in Genesis chapter 5, verse 25, <laughs> says it well. It says this, and he was not. <laughs> and he was not. He was no longer there. He was just gone. And, and that's a, this is a, a great picture. We'll, we'll talk about it on a future Sunday night. This is why in the Old Testament, this is a great picture of the, the, the future rapture of the church. It's very similar in description, very similar in process and so forth. And he was there and he was not. He was there and he was not. It's just gone. It was, it was no longer there, okay? And uh, he was not. A beautiful description there. Now look at the rest of verse 5 here in Hebrews, okay? The second part at least. By faith, Enoch was translated. They should not see death. Notice the statement. And was not found because God translated him, okay? You can imagine what happened there. Others, family members and friends around him began to ask, hey, where's Enoch? Hey, have you seen Enoch today, yesterday? I mean, when's the last time you saw Enoch? Where did he go? Does anybody know where Enoch went? And you can imagine the events that transpired around his translation, if we could describe it as such. You know what they did? 
Start looking for them, right? Uh, someone's missing. We've got we to alert the authorities. We've got to get out there and get a search party going. We've got to go to all his normal haunts and see if he's there. Find out what happened to Enoch. Where'd he go? Maybe he went out hunting. We need to send somebody out there in the bush, see if something happened to him. We've got to look for him. In fact, verse uh, chapter 11 here certainly tells us that that was what happened because it says he was not found. See, something or someone cannot be not found unless somebody's looking for them. So in order to be not found, someone's looking for him. Someone noticed. He's gone. We've got to find out what happened to Enoch. Where did he go? And uh, as they tried to find him, you can imagine they, they couldn't do so. He wasn't any, it, it was as if, <laughs> as we might put it in common terms or modern terms, it was as if he vanished off the earth. And that's exactly what he did. The Bible says God took him, just took him. Now, why would God do that? In other words, we'll ask the question as this would hit any reader of the passage. What, what was the reason God did this for Enoch? Well, the answer is given us in this verse, isn't it? Look at verse 5 again, the third part of it. Okay, by faith, Enoch was translated. They should not see death. He was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. All right, so now we're getting to the the idea of, okay, here's what was known about Enoch. We don't have much in the Scriptures. Not much is given prior to his life. We know he had Methuselah uh, and such. He lived 300-plus years after that. And uh, so we don't have much. But here's something, a glimpse, a reason. All right, so this is why he was translated. Of all those people listed in Genesis chapter 5, here's why Enoch was translated. Experienced what no man had ever experienced up until that point. He had a good testimony. It's a good testimony to have. We'll talk about it in a moment. But let's be honest. It seems very basic. It seems a general statement. There's not much description or detail given. It's a a surface statement. Well, he pleased God. Well, that's good. But uh, what about more details? Uh, It begs the question um, uh, for more details to be revealed, okay? So he had the reputation. Something was well known about him in heaven and in earth, right? And uh, that was this truth that he pleased God. Don't get me wrong, great testimony, right? Great, great reputation to have both in heaven before God and on earth before men. That he pleased God by how he lived and so forth. So we'll, we'll talk, expound upon that here in a moment. But that begs the question again. We, we just follow logically. How did Enoch please God? What was it about him? Because I don't know about you. I, I'm standing where I am today, and I, I want to please God, don't you? I, I want to I know what's going to please God, what's going to make him happy, what certainly can cause me to reap the fruit of faith. Uh, not necessarily a translation, but I want God's favor. I want God's blessing. So how did Enoch please God? How was it that he pleased God? Well, it's a, I think it's a good question to ask. Obviously, the easy answer would be the first part of verse 5, right? What does that say? Well, by faith, by faith. That's why he's in this chapter. He had faith. And that's an easy answer, but I want to dig deeper. What was it about his faith? How did his faith show up in his living? To the degree that God said he had a testimony that he pleased me, So much so that he was translated. That God said, boy, I want you with me right now. Whoop. He took him. So what was it about him? Well, that drives us back to Genesis chapter 5. And for sake of time, let me just put it up here for you. You can certainly turn there and look. It says this, and Enoch lived 60 and 5 years. He begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah 300 years. And he begat sons and daughters. In all the days of Enoch were 360 and five years. And Enoch walked with God, and he was not, for God took him. Basically, the only verses outside of this one and one in Jude that we see Enoch mentioned here within the Scripture. But here's the example. Now, we, we get a little further. Okay, So number one, he pleased God. We get that. That's great. Great reputation. He pleased God. How did he please God? Well, by faith. We get that from verse number five. Great, wonderful. But what did that faith look like? 
How did it play out in his life on a day-to-day -day basis? Now we're starting to get down into some nitty-gritty. We find a little bit more of the details, and it's simply this, is what we're told according to Genesis chapter 5. Enoch displayed walking faith. Abel, worshiping faith. That's crucial because that's important. Recognize God for who he is, to worship him for who he is. Now we come to Enoch, and Enoch really takes us on the next step in the Christian maturation process. I love how this is a picture in Hebrews 11 of the growth of, a, of you and I as believers, as Christians, okay? Abel understood how to worship God, but Enoch takes us to the next level. The concept of daily walking with God. So it's good for you and I together on Wednesday night and on Sunday nights. It's, it's good for us to worship God wherever we are. Worship's important. It's necessary. We recognize God for who he is. But can I tell you, the Christian life is to be much more than that. It's to be walking with God in relational uh, uh, interactions, a relationship that we're walking with God. So Enoch is a great picture of that truth and that concept here. In fact, I would put it this way. Adam and Eve lost a bunch of things in the Garden of Eden. And so as God interacts now with mankind, he's slowly reintroducing the aspects of restoration of what was lost in the Garden of Eden. First of all, it's recognizing God for who he is. Because you know what fell immediately in the estimation of mankind in the Garden of Eden? Adam and Eve basically said, God, you're not God. Because what you say doesn't mean much to me. We think we know better. So through the worshiping and acknowledging God for who he is as God of all creation, we're starting to build that back up in the thoughts, the psyche of mankind. And so as Abel is taught by mom and dad and Cain is taught by mom and dad to worship God in an appropriate manner in the way that God does, now we're getting back to where the Garden of Eden was at the beginning. The next step is what? What did Adam and Eve enjoy about the Garden of Eden? They got to walk with God, didn't they? They got to walk in the garden. We have, we have great hymns about it. In the garden, and the reality of, boy, they got to spend good time with him. And, boy, that's something that you and I now enjoy as believers and so forth. And Enoch now is picturing the restoration of walking with God, true fellowship with God. So what does it mean that Enoch walked with God? You, you know it. Let's just spell it out, though. Number one, it speaks of fellowship and communing with God. If we could have Adam and Eve here tonight and we could interview them, I dare say that their hearts would still be broken over the reality of what they lost in the Garden of Eden. That the God of heaven would come and walk with them in the cool of the evening or whenever. He would walk with them and, and talk with them and they would be in his presence without a, a thought of anything else, without a concern of anything else. They would just be able to fellowship and commune with the God of heaven, their creator. And that was lost. And yet, because of what God wants to do for mankind, he's slowly, surely restoring us to that. You see, it speaks of fellowship and communing with God. And this is not just a mere, a, a mere acquaintance idea. It is not just a few moments here and there with no plan or organization to time spent in his presence. There's two things that are really borne out, we could say, here within Enoch's life. It's why he is mentioned in Hebrews 11. It's borne out in what the little that we know about his life. Notice it, if you will. <coughs> These things, two things are, are clear. Walking with God was his desire, and he was diligent to do so. Walking with God was his desire, and he was diligent to do so. The old adage is as true today as it's ever been. It's simply this. What you value most, you will prioritize most. What you value most, you will prioritize most. Now, that has been borne out in Enoch's life. He did just that. It's pretty clear from Genesis chapter 5 that walking with God marked the majority of his life. In fact, it wasn't just a few years, as many. We are clear on at least 300 years. 365 he lived, but likelihood it was for the majority of that time. He walked with God. Now, can I tell you, listen to me. You don't walk with God for a lifetime that spans 300 plus years without desiring it. 
without having a heart and a passion, say, you know what? I need to meet with God. I need to talk with God. I need to communicate, commune in fellowship with my God. I need to spend time in his presence. I, I can't go on today without interacting with my God in prayer and reading his word. You have to have a desire for your life to be marked by walking with God for 300 plus years. Now, I'll tell you right now, there ain't no way on God's green earth that I want to live here 300 years. Okay, I'll just tell you that today. But for our 70 years, however long God gives us, whatever that may be, can I tell you, you're going to have to desire to walk with God. You know, the older we get, we realize what? Nothing happens in our life without us desiring it. Good things, things we ought to do. Okay? Have you ever desired to lose weight and it happened? You just desired. You didn't work out. You didn't do anything. You didn't stop your eating habits. You didn't change anything. You just desired. Boy, I wish it worked that way, didn't you? I wish you could work up, wake up in the morning and say, you know what? I want to lose 10 pounds today. I really desire that. By the end of the day, whoo, 10 pounds gone. That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? See, nothing good like that happens and it, just because you desire it. But the reality is this. If you desire something enough and you do really desire it, that can affect what you do so that you can accomplish it. See, Enoch desired to walk with God. And you know what? He desired it so much, it showed up in his diligence. It cannot be written about somebody that they walked with God for 300 plus years unless they were diligent. Diligent. They sought after God. They looked for God. They came to God. And those words are all used in the next couple of verses here. Unless that is true of a person, it will not be written of you and I that we walked with God unless we, we diligently desire it. We desire it, we want it, and then we are diligent about fulfilling that desire. That's exactly what happened with Enoch. That's why it's written of him that he pleased God. How did he please God? Oh, yes, by faith. But his faith showed up in the everyday walking with God. He walked with him. He yearned for fellowship and communion with him. He desired it on a daily basis and even more so than that. You see, his relationship with God was everything. He prioritized that. The things of, of the Lord were important to him. In Jude, the only other reference in the New Testament of Enoch in, that, in this sense, correlating to this, um, it speaks of him prophesying about the things of the Lord and him coming with his saints and so forth. He cared about the things of God. This length of time shows us that he was diligent, that he had a desire for something that he did diligently pursued. And can I remind you and I that if you and I don't make something a priority without uh, um, being diligent over many, many years, then it will not come to fruition. It will not happen unless we diligently desire it. Enoch is an example and a challenge to you and I today to diligently desire walking with the Lord, fellowship and communion. See, that's not all there is to walking with the Lord, though. We know this true, and the Scriptures bear witness of it. Throughout the New Testament, the term walk, when applied to the Christian life, represents what? Faithful living. Faithful living. There's a myriad of references within the New Testament describing the Christian life as a walk. As a walk. Let me give you a few examples. Obviously, there's many more, but let me just give you a few examples. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, a familiar one. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also, and I, I like this. He says, listen, we, this is what we should do. Even so we also should walk in newness of life. Not like the old man, but the new man. Not like the old life, but the new life. We ought to walk in that. And so it's an encouragement, a challenge to you and I. This Christian life now is all about faithful living, living unto God. Literally is what it means, okay? Uh, the next verse, Ephesians 5, 8. For ye were sometimes darkness before when you didn't know Christ. But now ye are light in the Lord. That's the only way that it happens. You are changed from light, darkness to light. Therefore, as children of light, you ought to walk as children of light. The challenge for you and I. Say, listen, there ought to be a difference in your living now. You, you, you ought to... You ought to walk with the Lord. And how you walk with the Lord is the faithful living. It goes on in Colossians chapter 1 and verse 10 as Paul would challenge the church at Colossae that ye might walk worthy. Now this really brings it into play, doesn't it? Because we ask the question, uh, well, what does it mean that Enoch pleased God? Well, by faith, and he walked with the Lord. Notice this statement, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all 
pleasing. Not pleasing your mankind, not pleasing, though that might happen. The reality is we're focused on the Lord, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. I want to be pleasing unto God. One of the ways I'm pleasing unto God is walking with God. One of the ways I walk with God is through faithful living to his word, to his commands. Simply stated, what, what is it? Well, it's simply stated to walk with God is to be faithful in our living to the desires and wishes of our Lord. Faithful living. We talk about walking with God. I, I, I'd have be diligently desiring a fellowship and communion, number one. Number two, I also ought to be diligently desiring to have faithful living. In other words, in obedience to the wishes and commands, the desires of my Lord. Uh, we talked on, on Sunday, the, the kingship, the lordship of Jesus Christ in our lives. It is something that you and I should all be pursuing in our lives, the lordship of Jesus Christ. And this it comes to play, right? That he, his wishes, his desires, that's faithful living. Putting him first, prioritizing what God says, what he wants, what he desires in my life. And I like uh, as we get to the point here, okay? The basic, uh, in its basic form or the basic deduction of this, walking with God. It involves fellowship and faithful living springing from or springing forth from personal gain. Or personal faith, excuse me, personal faith, okay? Springs forth from personal faith. This is the key to Enoch. This is, is why is he mentioned here in Hebrews 11, 5? Why is it right there in the middle of the cemetery chapter in Genesis chapter 5 is this highlighted about Enoch and he was translated? Why? Because he walked with God. He had fellowship and communion with him regularly. He, he was faithful in his living to God. He prioritized the wishes, the desires of God. And that all sprung, verse number five, by faith. From personal faith in God. And if that isn't clear enough, he, he's going to go on and explain a little bit more of the author here, the Holy Spirit particularly. But notice, this is Enoch. This is what he did well. He did it continually, so much so that God himself tells us this is his testimony, right? This is his reputation. He pleased God. And that ought to challenge you and I to have the same desire, diligence uh, to please him. But maybe when we read the story, it, it, it sparks within us this question. Well, how do you and I then please him? Then I would be like that. I, 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 I want to be like Enoch. I, I desire that too. And it's as if the Holy Spirit anticipates that question, and so he does answer it by way of giving us another principle or more details or description about faith. Look at verse number 6 with me. Look at verse number 6 quickly. We know it well. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe okay, that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now let's break it down quickly. Very, very Number one, you know what it says? Enoch is given as an example of an impossibility. Okay? We hear people say, that's impossible all the time. Well, this is, this is true. This is impossible. What is it that's impossible? Well, the verse makes it clear, right? For anyone to attempt to please God with anything other than faith is pure folly and futility. The attempt to please God with anything, i.e., we go back to Cain. We can go to others who have attempted to please God with something they've done. They're living, you name it, whatever they put in the blank, they've attempted to please God with something other than, fa than faith. That is pure folly and futility. Literally, the terminology here, it's impossible. There is absolutely no way to please God without faith, period. Romans says that uh, if it is not of faith, it is sin, the Bible says. Hmm. The Greek here is in the aorist tense. You say, what in the world does that mean? What's the point of that? It just simply means this. It, it, it speaks to the impossibleness of it. The, the, literally, the absolute impossibility of something happen. There is absolutely no way for you to please God without faith. So let's apply that principle to something we see people struggle with every day. There are many today who are trying to gain salvation, please God for salvation through works. 
I've heard the, the, the terminology. I've shared it with you before. I've heard the statement from somebody. Well, I, I just think when I get to heaven, I, I've lived a good enough life that God will let me in. You ever hear that? I've done enough good. I've done, and I like this one, I've done more good than bad. Always begs the question, it's like, are we talking like 51, 49 percent or what? what? What are we talking here? You know? But that's what they'll say. I've, I've done more good than bad. You know what we're saying in that statement? God will be pleased with my 62.5 percent of good. But that's not what the scripture says. But without faith, it is what? possible to please him it really has nothing to do with your good works because all your good works hate to tell you they're filthy rags they amount to nothing compared to the righteousness of god the holiness of an almighty god they amount to nothing it's impossible to please god but aren't you thankful that when you and i approach god through faith you know what our faith produces good works that are acceptable in god's sight Boy, we so often get the cart before the horse. We, we say, hey, uh, God, you got, you got to set my good works. You ought to be pleased with my good works. No, you want to please God, it starts with faith. <laughs> you might even say it begins and ends with faith, amen? But faith also produces fruits that pleases God. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. And I think of those people who came and I know we've re referenced it earlier, or, or re recently, I should say. Those people who come to Christ, and they say, hey, have we not cast out devils in your name? Have we not done many miracles in your name? Have we not done this and this and this in your name? Have we not taught Sunday school? Did we not attend church? Did we not give in the offering plate regularly? And he says what? Depart from me, for I never knew you. There is no relationship established on faith. There is no connection. There is no personal relationship because that only occurs through faith and trust in Jesus Christ. It's only established that way. Then after that, all the other stuff can fall into place. Here, Hebrews chapter 11 is reaffirming that truth. Then the verse goes on and explains this. If you want to approach God, if you want to come to God, if you want to seek God like Enoch did, and, and if you want to be that person, then faith must find a resting place in two specific areas of your life. In fact, it uses the word believe twice. Did you catch that as we read it? It uses the word believe twice. So what is it that we must believe? Real quickly. Number one. God is more real than anything we know to be real with our five senses. God is more real than anything we know to be real with our five senses. The Bible puts it this way in this verse. Must believe that what? He is. That he is. That he is in existence, if we might describe it. This is where it starts. Believing that he indeed is real. That he exists beyond a shadow of a doubt. That the one true God of heaven and earth, the God of the Bible, the creator of all, is more real than anything we know to be real. I'll tell you right now, I, I know this pulpit is real. I touch it. I feel it. At times, I, you can even smell the, the stuff coming off of it and so forth. I know it. I've lifted it. It's heavy. I know this, this, this pulpit is real, but I'll tell you, I know beyond a shadow of doubt, my God is real. See, that's where it starts. You must believe that he is. You want to come to him in faith, it starts with believing that he is. This is the kind of faith that God is pleased with. Furthermore, it's also the kind of faith that God rewards. You see, we can offer many tangible and logical evidences or arguments for the existence of God. And we can go on to the ontological argument, all these kinds of arguments we can throw out there, the logical evidence. But when it's all said and done, it is still a matter of faith. And if you want to walk with God, it starts here. You must believe that God is. That he is. And my goodness, God loves that kind of faith, that kind of belief. A settledness, a confidence of such faith. And it comes from belief, the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, as the author would put it here. Enoch believed this. And because he believed it so much, his desire was towards that God that is. 
first step in pleasing God. Believe that he is. The second part says what? Number two, and we're done. God is worth your everything. God is worth your everything. You must believe that he is, and notice what he says the rest of the verse, and that he is a rewarder of them, there's our word, that diligently seek him. He is a moral, he is a just God, he is a good God. He is a God that will always reward faith in him. He has revealed to us as a personal, loving, gracious God to those especially who seek him diligently as Enoch did. Literally, he is not some impersonal cosmic force out there in the universe. But rather, he is a living God to be believed in and known in a personal way, to have a personal relationship. Why did Enoch uh, have a testimony that he walked with God? Because he knew and believed that God is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. He believed it. He took it to heart. This was his desire towards such a God. If I were to ask you to list some of the most intelligent people uh, in the world that have ever lived, uh, you could probably throw out a few names and people like Dave Cooper, um, Albert Einstein, you know, all those good guys who are highly intelligent, right? And um, uh, we say Einstein, right? He's a man, smart guy, super intelligent. And sir, he is. I mean, Einstein probably has known more or has forgotten more than I know, amen? And uh, so I get that, right? But in some things, Einstein was foolish, Say, what was he foolish in? Notice the statement. He says this, certainly there is a God. Okay, I'm with you there. Any man who doesn't believe in a cosmic force is a fool. Amen, I kind of agree with that too. Then he makes this statement, but we could never know him. You know how sad of a statement that is? It's kind of heartbreaking. There's a God in heaven, but he doesn't want you to seek him. He doesn't want you to know him. In fact, there's no way that you can do so. That'd drive you mad, or man, or make your hair stand up. Okay, I'm just kidding. Okay, um, <laughs> someone will get that later. Um, <laughs> there's a God, but you can't know Him. Can I just tell you, Einstein was dead wrong, because the scriptures are pretty clear about that. We can know God, and in fact, we must know Him in order to please Him. For without faith, it is impossible. To please him. Without faith, it is impossible to please him. And as you and I come to know the God of heaven personally, we quickly learn that he is indeed a rewarder of those who desire uh, to uh, desire him, to have that relationship with him. He is also a rewarder of those whose desire is directed towards him, who diligently seek after him in all things. May I just tell you tonight, you know what Enoch tells us? That God is worth your everything tonight. Your daily dogged pursuit of fellowship with him, he's worth it. You're pouring out of your life, your riches, and your time at his feet, he's worth it. You're forsaking of this life and this world, living for the next life and investing in the world to come, he is worth it. In your daily diligence this week to please him by walking in faith, may I just tell you, He's worth it. He is worth your everything. So give it to him. Give it to him. Please him this week. Would you walk with him this week? Would you, would you enjoy some fellowship and communion with him? And would you just, would you give it to him? Because he is worth your everything. Put it on the altar. Allow him to have it this week. You know what the Hebrews are saying here, and I'm done? That God is the perfect embodiment. There is no greater embodiment of these terms, faithful and rewarder. He is faithful, and he is a rewarder. You'll never go unrewarded with God. You'll never go unrewarded. The verse says it all, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them, or to them, that diligently seek him. Walk with him, please him, seek him this way. Brother Cliff, you'll bring those.